kind of appropriately named this panel Making Machines Creative. And so we've wanted to give you all a sense of, you know, how does artistic, um, you know, being artistic, being a creative, how does that affect the world when we have this technology? How do we um, accentuate the positive? How do we make sure that, uh, you know, that we're making sure that we're um, focusing on uh, kind of the domain expertise or the, the passion and expertise of the individual? And how do we let AI or machines augment that passion and expertise? So we have a few questions that we're gonna ask the panel that'll give us a chance to really dive deeper into just kind of an editorial view of machines meeting the creative world and what that what that means and kind of what we've experienced in our careers. And maybe to start off, um, do we wanna wait to do the intros? Just a few more minutes? So I'll just have them maybe start off with a, a little experience, if you don't mind. Okay, so I would, I'm just gonna have the panel kind of share uh, a little bit about how they, I mean, most, I don't think any of us here grew up in AI um, or what we consider AI today. So I'd like to understand just a little brief um, understanding for the audience of how you got introduced to AI and what, you know, how that went for you. Oh, you have your own mic. So let's start with you, Scott, and we'll work our way down. I'm, I'm a, do you, are you talking about the AI of our childhood? Or is no, that like of AI of today, what we consider. with the beginnings of our experience. Yeah. Our experience with AI today. Yeah, I mean, because in, in my childhood, you're right, certainly we didn't, we didn't have computers that were doing things like they do today, but there was AI in, you know, fiction and, and culture and in our sort of... That's actually, I'm good with either of those because those are good stories. <laughs> <laughs> so either how you got introduced to the idea of AI before our computers mm -hmm. could do it or either way. So feel Yeah, because for, for myself, I've been working on... Um, on AI and on, on AI art for really for maybe 30 years, long before the, um, the current trend of AI started. A lot of people, uh, AI is in the media now, but you know, for a lot, it's been around for a long time. It was sort of dormant for a while. There was what was called the AI winter. Okay. Everybody thought AI was a failure, um, but you know, it's, it's sprung again and you know, times are good, maybe, you know, maybe too good. <laughs> And then there'll be, you know, another winter, <laughs> exactly, there'll be another wave, another season, and, you know, things will, the cycle will continue. Um, you know, me personally, I think one of my, some of my really early sort of encounters with the, the beginnings of this stuff was, you know, with, with a computer, something that I spent a lot of time with as a kid. And there were sort of a, a couple of really formative experiences I had. And one was essentially really trying to sort of entertain myself by programming computer graphics and trying to sort of come up with kind of an, an equation which when drawn by the computer would then sort of in, make, be in, interesting to me. Um, and I was really sort of fascinated by sort of like I could make it do things, I could use randomness to make it, to make it do things, but you know, usually those things like looked random. Right. I didn't really feel like the computer was talking to me. But every once in a while I would sort of get lucky and either you know the the wheels would align, and something sort of aesthetic or uh, creative even would seem to come out of the, c the computer just because uh, just because of randomness. And so there was w a little light went off there. And another thing that happened was I was then uh, writing code, and I discovered that sometimes you know like I made a mistake essentially like a, c a coding bug that actually looked really cool and was maybe a sort of a mutation or sort of something unexpected, something that was really random, um, but that was also sort of creative and, uh, and beautiful and valuable. And so that was kind of the beginning of a process of creativity sort of coming from this machine. Yeah, I love that. That's great. Thank you. Kat? So uh, I, I had a, a background in theoretical mathematics. And um, at some point, I was like, I'm gonna run away to Berlin to be an artist. Um, and I did theater, so there's nothing more antithetical. Uh, live performance and mathematics, they really have zero in common. And it was very hard for me to explain to people for a long time 
what I thought I was doing, and but I, I had siloed my life into, oh, okay, well, I got a job as a software engineer because I can do that for a living, um, and I have this other theater career, um, and I never told one world about the other world that I lived in because I was scared I wouldn't be taken seriously. Um, and so I, some point more recently, and uh, came to the realization, all right, well, I'm an... I'm a um, artist technologist, whatever that means. Um, and I, I, one thing more recently that I started to wonder about is, well, how do I, who cares so much about the beauty of language, deal with the idea of um, computers generating text um, or generating images or generating paintings? Um, and I think I was gonna, write a little essay about that, and it turned into a whole TED Talk. So I had a lot to say about that. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thanks, Kat. Mar well, um, I was really in love for this girl. And I remember we were together <laughs> in this uh, uh, concert uh, from Massive Attack, and on the background was all this HTML moving with the music. And she told me, oh my god, so cool, HTML. And I was, I was studying completely other things. I was studying fi physics. and. I was not really interested in nothing interactive at the moment, or computer, really focused on computer. And then uh, I shift and I decide to uh, look inside the very basic technology like HTML, and then I start to be in passion for JavaScript, and then Python. And then uh, um, I grow with my career, I was in MIT, and then uh, I study uh, natural science with uh, Laszlo Barabasi, then I become professor, and then I decide to uh, there was not enough resources in university, so I decided to move to IBM Research, and I take all the cloud <laughs> from my <laughs> to make all my experiment. And uh, so I think it just uh, was not really a passion for me; it was just a coincidence. Well, I mean, there was love there involved. Was love, yeah. So, <laughs> yes, thank you. Great, Jean. Um, this this question has evolved from. How did you get started with AI to what is your bi biography? <laughs> so, which, totally which would you like? Um, yeah, I got interested in machine learning. Like, let's, um, yeah, like when I was in college. AI is like a very poorly defined, it's mostly a pop culture term. Um, but machine learning, I got started in college and I, w I worked for a couple of years as like a, a research assistant in music, music technology, machine learning applied to music technology. And then I've always been interested in sort of the, like obviously being in music, I was interested in the creative artistic potential of it, and so I just kind of just always worked at that at that in that area, and then it, it really started to blow up a few years ago, and then I just doubled my efforts. Um, yeah. Wonderful, thank you. Yeah, I think it's interesting. A lot of the people that it, you know, AI, as we've all mentioned, has been around a really long time. Uh, I know some researchers that have been doing this over thirty years, and when they built their original research they were like not popular. No one read the papers they published. I think one person had said prior to 2015, their paper had been read 900 times and they wrote it in 84, which is not great numbers if you do the math. Um, and m probably many times it was like their mom, right? <laughs> <laughs> Trying to like, hey honey, you got one more, <laughs> one more view. Um, but today, that same researcher is like a rock star, has over a million views of their uh, paper, which was written actually about natural language, which is all the rage these days. Um, but more importantly, has now spoken on a dozen stages to people like her, who like clap voraciously and experience that now he's looking back going, man, how far we've come where I was like before embarrassed to tell people I even wrote the paper. And now, right, people are asking him to broadly kind of have it on the largest stages in the developer world. So, so it's really cool to see how far we've come uh, in a really short time in our lifetime specifically. I do want to give everyone a chance uh, just to kind of give us a history and an understanding of what they're doing today. Um, a couple of us have brought some slides. So I just want to give, uh, we're going to go through one more time and just now that everyone's back from break, give everyone a chance to do kind of a more official introduction uh, of themselves and where they came from. So we'll start with Scott. Thank you. And um, will this go to mine? OK, great. So um, the, the story that I told you about me as a kid, like doing, doing random computer graphics, was the um, 
was the beginning of this idea that the computer sort of could create art. And uh, my art is really about this, that relationship between humanity and the computers and determining, you know, um, where do we draw the lines, you know, between is the computer our slave? Does it just do what it, do what we say? Or does it have its own agency? You know, does it have some sort of creativity or some, you know, responsibility or, or some consciousness? You know, can computers really do anything new? And so I, uh, my first sort of uh, steps in this direction uh, were in about 1990 when I created a flame algorithm, which was like a new kind of rendering uh, technique and a new sort of visual language. And I released it as open source. And so along with you know, the code that could draw these pictures and a collection of pictures, and it sort of has, uh, the project has sort of been growing and expanding uh, since then. It got incorporated into the usual sort of like Photoshop and After Effects, and it really became a whole sort of genre of art and grew you know, way beyond what just sort of I myself could do on my own. And that's a sort of a, a really, I think the way that open source code works and grows has actually become really important to artificial intelligence all the sort of standard tools that AI researchers use are open source and they are also, you know, trained with data, which is um, also copied. So I think that was um, uh, something that is important for sort of realizing this, uh, where, where we're all going. And so this uh, flame algorithm became like a sort of a a genre of its own and is sort of appears in all kinds of places like uh, this is the cover of Stephen Hawking's book and um, Paul Simon's uh, last album. This is the cover. These were made with my algorithm. I didn't get any credit or remuneration because I made this thing open source and other people download it and use it to make their own art. And they, they, um, it's a way for me to sort of ex exceed my own boundaries as an artist and um, sort of create that unexpected thing. and give the chance the, for the computer to sort of uh, to speak and sort of tell us something instead of us just telling the computer what to do. And so really, um, so it started out with those still images, but that turned into eventually in about 1999 into with animation and creating um, uh, an online cloud sort of AI computer which creates art in order to satisfy uh, the audience who's watching it. So all the people who are running electric sheep can vote on whether or not they like what they see, and the AI uses that feedback to design new animations, you know, using this genetic algorithm and the visual language of the uh, of the flame algorithm. And so the electric sheep has been growing also and has gone lots of places. You just saw it in a big New York museum, and here it is also with uh, Skrillex and, and Grimes on tour on a in a train in Canada somewhere. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't attend that party. But um, it's uh, the electric sheep is um, still still evolving, and there's a sort of the latest incarnation of it is up in the art show here. And uh, let's see, we'll be happy to sort of talk about what it's capable of and what it means um, in this panel and afterwards if you're interested. So that's my intro. Here you go. So I'm really glad I got to do the whole like theater and mathematics spiel because now I can just say I gave a TED talk last year. Um, I, I started with the question, what does it mean that bots can generate poetry, music, paintings? They're doing that right now. Y'all know that. Um, and uh, the answer that I came to is I'm now writing up into a book because I realized that I had a point of view about it, uh, which Few, very few people were talking about it in quite this way. Um, one of the pieces of my thesis, and it's only a small part, is using the metaphor of puppetry to think about what these generative systems are doing. So if maybe we're mis misunderstanding what we're looking at when we're looking at creative machines, um, bot-generated poetry might be a very interesting kind of artifact. But if you st take a step back, you, we might realize that uh, it's the bots themselves that are works of art. Um, and puppetry helps to kind of elucidate 
how that kind of works. Um, they puppets have puppet masters, so there's always humans who are uh, infusing these bots with their actions, and a lot of the generative art that we see is, I mean, counter to a lot of the rather fantastical claims about artificial intelligence is creating art. Um, what, what's really going on is a kind of a dance between um, a human, sometimes many humans, uh, and a machine. There's decision making sort of step by step uh, along these processes. And, and um, although puppetry doesn't entirely describe everything that's going on, it's clearly, a, I, I think, that what we're seeing is a wholly new medium and that um, theater and performance art and puppetry can help us kind of understand what we're seeing, how to evaluate a successful example of the thing. Um, and I think what we're missing, um, and I, what, I'm, what I like to fill in, is uh, a, a language for talking about the aesthetics of, of these be machine behaviors. Um, and I, I, I think that they are um, these kinds of performance pieces that have their own aesthetics. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think I'm explaining it quite as uh, well as I did in my TED talk, but that was scripted. This is not. Um, and I'm just going to then uh, very quickly give you two sentences about the other work I do, which is creative as an artist technologist. Uh, this is a piece I'm currently working on. Um, it's about a cyclops who lives in Manhattan and is in love with a woman who has no interest in him. And, the, uh, and he seeks out plastic surgery to have a second eye implanted into his head. Um, and this is the kind of story that I write. I, I have always written rather odd kinds of uh, metaphors as, uh, in, as my plays. Uh, I've written plays about people turning to lizards. I wrote a play once about a woman who has a sexual relationship with a swan. And for years, I would get um, people reading these and being like, well, this is beautiful. I have no idea how to stage this. Um, but the insight for me, and I think it came pretty recently in my development, is technology can help make all of these metaphors uh, vivid. And so I can have my Cyclops on stage because it's not that hard. Well, it, it, it's a little hard to figure out how to like, you know, create a blinking eye sort of costume headpiece, which, by the way, I'm working on now, if anyone wants to help. Um, but I think that's been the, the great creative insight for me that, um, oh, I should have been like, there we go. Um, oh, and I have a note for myself. I'm looking for collaborators. Help me make my thing. Um, and so I, I just end with uh, the idea that, you know, if you're thinking about machines performing uh, or humans performing while augment, augmented with some piece of technology, I, my, uh, the core of what I do as an artist is uh, because I believe that live performance is the defining medium of the digital age and as the uh, young kids say, fight me. Yeah. Well, I think it's clear my name is Mauro Martino and, uh, and starting from the left uh, there is a sequence of uh, projects uh, all related to the um, machine learning field. So from the left, uh, there is this uh, uh, slice of cat that come from the famous um, data set quick draw. So all these million people. So I start now two years ago this collaboration with uh, um, the department of Google that was producing this game. And uh, so we use a lot of analytics to explore all this one billion enough data. And uh, and now it's part of the permanent collection of uh, uh, Linz Museum, no, Ars Electronica. And um, yeah, it was an incredible effort. It was my, my first really big challenge with uh, machine learning to explore the data. I tried to take out something meaningful from all this collection. And the nice thing was that part of this data set was public available. It was really an open competition with all around the world to make the best possible visual output. Then there is a, a friend of mine, Charlotte, the next one, then is, is, is there in a kind of portrait made by Hypertraits. is a, a tool that they decide to put online uh, 
just because was all this attention to the idea of make portrait by AI, and I was feeling, well, who, who will take a code and run stuff uh, with a machine with GPU to have a portrait with AI? Let's make free available online. You just click a button, <laughs> you have something. So it's a form of democratization, but of course, uh, the idea was not just to make available one model, so I, I pick one, but you can generate portrait in different way. And I pick this type of uh, watercolor effect because uh, uh, the output is very close to the input. So um, my father is, uh, uh, or I think it is, an artist, so he paints. Uh, in, I come from Calabria in, in Italy. So he never sell one of his paint, but for me he's an artist. And uh, always uh, is, he have a pleasure to make a portrait of the guest we have at home. And always uh, the portrait doesn't look really close to the to our guest, and there is this debate, but it's not me. No, it's the way that I see you. So this is a feeling to, uh, you know, to enter and die inside of this experience, someone make a portrait of you, and it was very hard to see with the eye, because uh, you can be very close to the original picture, or very far away, but uh, what is this between? That you feel you're there, your friend thinks you're there, but you don't feel that. So I was trying to reproduce the <laughs> talent of my father with this algorithm. So now it's available online, and 200,000 people decide to put the face. So I think uh, always um, I'm happy to have this big number uh, related to the work they try to put online. And then uh, some experiment, of course, in area of uh, what's happening inside to the neural net, and it's essentially a big part of my real work, uh, is um, you know, the effort to work in area of explainability. So explore inside the neural net. So you can take out a lot of good things, bad things, but for sure there is this new aesthetic that everybody play with, and I think it's really changed our idea of what computer can do in terms of uh, art output. And then there is uh, probably uh, the project that makes me <laughs> sad, happy, exciting every day, because I, I'm still working on that, as not able to put out, and I love too much to really put out and give to everybody. So I just make some paper in few conferences to talk about the technology beyond that. And um, the first version was WonderNet. It's a project that is online, but it just doesn't reveal the part about uh, um, machine learning. So this little man on top to this real sculpture. So I start to build essentially sculpture by using um, this technology. And then um, I evolved this uh, uh, algorithm, and now is able to um, follow all my requirements. So simulate a human body gesture, or express itself in a way they want. So uh, this is a problem, because uh, this algorithm is generated trillion of sculpture. And what to put outside, and what way I can manage all this output and make meaningful the, the model. So essentially, reproduce everything that we can image. So now the effort is more in the area of data visualization, because I need to find a criteria to explore all this uh, incredible uh, collection of uh, visual uh, and, uh, well, 3D sculpture. So, and, and I spend, of course, a lot of money because I love to print all this sculpture. And because the output is infinite, and I'm not Bill Gates, so a, the problem is coming. So. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I have no slides, so I'll just like, I'll talk, I guess. Um. Uh, sorry, the, the second slide. Just wonder, that's amazing. So you can just pretend that's mine. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So this is something I made all by myself <laughs> last year. On an open source model. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, yeah. I guess. Well, I got interested in machine learning for, like, like I mentioned before, music music recommendation was actually like the thing that was really interesting to me. And then maybe started making art with it like shortly after that. I got interested in deep learning about five or six years ago when it was still kind of maybe like still trying to prove itself within machine learning. And then um, I, when, the, when the field began to really attract a lot of like, uh, like public attention, that, that, which I, I'd say maybe like 2015, I started uh, putting a lot of educational resources online because there was just a lot of like, uh, you know, clamor to try to understand how to use these things. I started building something uh, called Machine Learning for Artists, ML4A. Um, which you can find online, which is all this um, sort of educational materials. During that time, I, um, I've been really interested in generative models, which is this uh, branch of machine learning, which is concerned with 
generating things and because it's of course it's very very relevant to generative art obviously there's a big overlap there and um that's been my my main focus and then you know combining it with the kind of stuff that that i was talking about earlier with abraham is the next for me the the next part of the agenda like ai art has has really blossomed in the last two years and so i'm really just trying to think of like what's next um yeah actually a great segue um so Along the uh, lines of AI for Art, I think I had mentioned to some of you who are here this morning that I had this unique ability to work on a project where we brought together data scientists from MIT and curators from the Metropolitan Museum of Art to build something. At the time, it was a hackathon, which by definition means you have no idea what you're going to do, and then at the end, you've got something. Um, and we really struggled with the line, right? Where the line was drawn between, like where does art stop and data science or machines begin? So I'd love to maybe ask um, the panel, and any of you guys can jump in, uh, you know, do you, where do you see that line? Do you think that there is a line? Like what is your perception on kind of the difference or the relationship between art and machines? You can think about it. Oh, while you're thinking, we are going to open it up for questions. So I also wanted, if you guys have questions, um, I attend a lot of panels, and we always find like the audience sometimes can come up with even better questions than we can figure out for ourselves. So, and it's always fun to have this experience where you ask them a question they've never heard before, and they're like, "Let me think about it." Um, so if you have any questions, start thinking about them, uh, and as we answer, start kind of understanding each person. So maybe if there's something you want to know about any one of us, now's your kind of chance. Oh, and there's a mic, yeah, right in the middle so that we can record it uh, and make sure that everyone in the audience can hear your question. That would be great. So, yes, so again, um, maybe, yeah, oh, you sound like I you think, have one, Scott. Yeah, sure, I'll, I'll, start to, I'll start to talk. I think it's super blurred. Um, it used to be, you know, with, tr with traditional art, you knew who the artist was, and you could be pretty sure they did all the work themselves. They might have, an, or, you know, maybe they have an assistant or something like that. But now, uh, with machine learning art, there are so many people and so many layers of how stuff is made. It's really not clear um, where to to draw the lines, and you know it, it causes problems. You know, we not only is there a blurry line between what you might say, you know, like the person who ran the software, the person who wrote the software. You know, you now we're you know, the software itself. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the people who produced the data that goes into it, um, you know, the, the people who wrote the software toolkit underneath it all. I mean, there's just, there's so, there are so many components. It's really such a, um, a cultural effort, I think, that um, I don't know how to uh, disentangle it or, or, or simplify it except to just, you know, to warn people that, you know, you have to go deeper than like one name at the, at the top. You have to sort of read the article and experience the work, and um, really to find out where that, where you know, where where that's happening. And I think it's rewriting the rules of what we think of as art. Um, and obviously, there's a panel tomorrow. I think about um, attribution uh, and the legal implications, the uh, and the ownership implications of of this. And it's a problem for the art world, who which thinks that it wants to sell you an object. Um, if there we're not no longer talking about objects that are going to be sold, um, and I think we're seeing more and more we expect art to be interactive. We expect it to be something where we participate in, and that is no longer there's no longer an objecthood to art, uh, not in the way it's practiced at this cutting cutting edge, um, and because it's the way forward, it's really a, an, an enormous shift. I think the art that we are seeing now is the art that is going to be the art of the 20th century, of the, excuse me, of the 21st century. Um, and just like when film came along, it completely kind of rewrote all the rules of art. Um, I think art, the rules of art are currently being sort of upended and rewritten. 
Well, let's give priority yeah. to Oh, that. yeah, no, I, I just, uh, it, going along with what you're saying, actually, I was just thinking of an example that I know I was experiencing when I was talking to a lot of people. I don't know if you played with the Google Bach thing a couple of days. It was a like Google. Yeah, Google. I know. So it's actually really interesting because you can pop out the MIDI from what you generated, um, and then you can bring it into like GarageBand, and all my friends were like remixing it and making their own music out of it, which is a really interesting question because it's being fed information that's in the public domain. It's Bach; he's been dead for hundreds of years, and then but it was Google reprocess who trained an AI based off of something that was in the public domain to utilize something that you wrote the initial notes for. And then it made a chorus based off of, or sorry, a harmony, harmonized three other parts based off of what you wrote. So yeah, just going with what you were saying, like what does it even mean then when you're using stuff that's in the public domain to teach something and you know whose rights are in that when there shouldn't be any rights in it at all? Right, it's, it's almost like every person who painted a painting that is being used as part of the data set should be credited something, right? Um, but I think it's in, you bring up uh, Bach. Uh, it's it feels like the music industry is the one area of generative art uh, where they they've sort of like left the question of, oh my God, machines are creative. They've sort of like left that behind and gotten over it. And now they're like, oh, they're great tools, right? Like we can do things faster that we used to take us time. Um, I think maybe visual art uh, has to catch up and text-based stuff is a little different but yeah i will share with you at the met it was very difficult we created a machine learning model that ingested so the metropolitan museum of art recently opened uh 400 000 images and a basically an excel spreadsheet of descriptions for those images for anyone to use right so now anyone can create any app using this art um, and so someone in there, you know, like was like, oh, I have an idea, Friday night, let me build a machine learning model that will generate new art from the old art. Um, and then, and so literally every, it would transform based on, I think like the first image was a vase, based on a vase, it would transform into a boat, which would transform into a person, which, and none of that art was new, but it all looked familiar, similar to music. It had the same baseline, right, artistically, because it was all built on the same art, artistic artifacts. Um, but the uh, curators in the room were very concerned at the beginning, right? They were, there were some that were longtime curators that were kind of like, this is wrong. <laughs> like, I feel like something's wrong. And that happens, of course, when we go through massive change like this. Um, but that's kind of where this is going, right? Like how, how do we encourage uh, and inspire people to build these new things? And then how do we give those new things the same respect, um, you know, or the same level of appreciation that we do art that's been around for thousands or uh, hundreds of years. But great question and comment. Thank you so much. All right, sounds like we have another one. Great. Yeah, I kind of want to um, jump in on the same notion where we think, I mean, I think most artists you know, some people say we all steal from each other, everything is stolen from someone else. And I think when you go into the tactile world and if you think about cats talk, right, um, there are humans behind everything, all tech is human, but we forever used clay as a tool or a camera as a tool. These are things that we, that someone else before us has crafted. Someone figured out how to construct the clay. Someone figured out how to construct a lens, the camera, the light, whatever it is that you use to put into it. And so, yes, these algorithms, um, the machine learning, the data that's gone in is just a new pigment. It's a new thing. And so we can all, everyone can want credit where credit is due, but we don't look at the color yellow and think about like the bugs that got crushed up to like become that pigment of yellow. And so I think that as artists, when we ask ourselves like, what are we doing? How are we using this work? It's just another, um, part of society where we're all building this together. And I think so often in this, like, you know, like, I mean, look at social media. It's <laughs> like about me and like how I curate my image and what I am outputting. But so often nothing we output is really about us. It's about what we have all built together. And I guess I'm really curious to say, to see how do we figure out how to build together towards like machines of love and grace where we're looking at like 
using these things responsibly and asking ourselves like those important questions, like how is this going to impact? Yeah. Our Actually, future? I don't know. Have you know either of you had experience building? Like, have you how have you handled responsible AI? Have you encountered this at all? Have you implemented any practices around this? I'm just curious because you guys are kind of, or at least I know you're in kind of the academia now turned, you know, corporate research. I'm just interested to know, you know, along those lines, if you have any experience there. I don't, but. Cor corporate research? Me? Sorry? Yeah, sure. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not no, sure. <laughs> oh, sure. Yeah. Okay. You want to feel that? Either one of you can. <clears throat> oh, um, well, um, one nice thing about, like, doing uh, researching AI in the context of art is that the stakes are rather low you know so like um, I mean people can get hurt by AI but it's you know it, I'm not working with like weapons let's say so there's kind of like an opportunity there to to actually like maybe investigate certain questions before the stakes become too high so a lot of the stuff that I'm interested in so like you saw one of the things I showed in the Abraham talk was was me impersonating Trump and that was like maybe three years ago, something like three years ago with like very primitive sort of, you know, face, face swapping tech. And now three years later, that stuff is actually like really, really easy to, to use and it's super realistic. So one of the things that I tried to get across with when, when I made that originally was, hey, this stuff is coming. So maybe we should start a little discussion about how we'll, how we'll react to it and maybe, you know, how we're going to deal with it because it seems to have a lot of maybe very... Um, you know, worrisome aspects. And so that's, for, for me, like, art is a good vehicle to, to like, ask serious questions in a sort of unserious way um, and try to encourage people to, to um, like, make use of the technology themselves because almost every form of misuse of the technology relies on there being some asymmetry between, you know, people who have access to it and people who don't, or people who, who and, and by access I mean like just maybe just knowledge, like knowledge of how, how it works and how you could do it. Um, and so trying to like reduce those, uh, those asymmetries before, before it's too late is, um, is at least like one of, the, one of the goals, yeah. Great, thank you. <coughs> I think uh, the, the the boundaries between uh, the artist uh, use uh, AI is, is very strong in the sense uh, you you cannot consider yourself an artist because you do stuff that look unique uh, or you make some interpolation between picture paint uh, and um, in the same times I feel uh, the reproduce human capability to create art is kind of ridiculous no because uh, okay you make a portrait like uh, uh, two hundred years ago well, we did it so. Uh, but in the same times, we cannot stop to easily to to move people to this naive moment of living neural net technology, <laughs> uh, because uh, every time the people say, "I'm the first guy that make that," with I, I love it because it means that people are in passion. They feel uh, that the technology is close to you, and you can take out take uh, the code from GitHub and run, and you feel the author. And this is very lovely. And then uh, we have to do as much we can to push people to still feel proud mm -hmm. to do that. For the other side, you talk with artists. We talk about like the 200 artists that really have uh, uh, personality in the uh, moment, things, mm -hmm. artists that we consider artists. Uh, it sounds ridiculous to talk about AI art or digital art. You are an artist or not. There's no question about what type of artist you are. Oh, uh, thank you. <laughs> that was going to be one of my comments. <laughs> oh, so, but give another one, please. You're there, so. Yeah, um, sure. Uh, I was going to say there's no line uh, between art and technology, uh, and trying to define a line is counterproductive in, any, in every way. Um, but uh, my question is, so you talked about generative art as puppetry. And you talked about conversations with computers, not one way. My question is, what about when computers talk to each other and the human element is then two times removed and sort of thinking about that and, and if you have, if, I don't know. If you, if I'm any down of you guys for that. Have. <laughs> Why not? Right. Uh, but I, I think what, what happens there is that y un unless there's a human listener, 
it, it, it's meaningless. So you're still involving the human. You're having the human then listen in somehow and creating meaning in that way. So I, I think you're, you're never going to get away from the human. It, it would, I find it very helpful to remember uh, that 100 years ago when film came about, people, and f or photography for that matter, people freaked out because mm -hmm. what was so painstakingly made with a brush was suddenly cheaply reproduced over and over and over again. And, and, and that was hard to stomach. Um, and now we have this thing that feels like it's cheapening what we cherish, but it's just a potential to, um, to lead us into artistic expression that is, has a, just a different dimension to it. I completely agree. <laughs> Yeah, I, I like the idea of, you know, AI is not uh, ch sort of cheapening our own sort of consciousness and, and souls. Um, but I'm, I'm cur curious about the word you just said that um, computers talking to each other is meaningless. There has to be a human observer. And, and you said never. <laughs> but does it... I, I just, it's it's a little like the you know tree falls in the woods if anyone hears it it, it, it makes a sound you know it's it's that it feels like but, uh, but if, if but if but if computers were you know if strong AI AI were real and computers were as conscious and creative as we were then maybe it could happen or the computer creates I, someone to I talk mean, to I mean I think there's and a lot not of not to you right however. So. There are models today that work together. Software programs work together yeah. all the time, and that would be equivalent yeah. to them talking. I mean, they talk to each other all the time. Software is always doing that. Right. So there is a level of, I think maybe it's sentient, right? Like understanding and like having a philosophical discussion on the origin of that piece that maybe is missing. But what comes to mind as a dev, right, as someone who is part of the people pushing this code into production is that all of these models are built by people. All of those people have a very specific bias. Not bad or good, we are humans, it's the way we are born and raised. Um, but we have a very specific lens upon which we see the world and we then invest that lens into the data that trains a model to solve a problem, to be honest, that we personally care about. So we solve it in a way that we personally care about and eventually, those models will form the foundation of things that are going to be used to solve problems that we never thought about. So just think about the impact of our personal biases on our children's children's problems. They're going to be like, why does that act that way? That's such a bizarre answer to that question. And it's because someone like me wrote into the model, don't forget to consider this really off, you know, because this crazy thing is going to happen, right? So. The, it's definitely layered, and you guys both talked about this, the layered context as we, we're kind of at the beginning of exposing what machine learning models, what machine learning can do for the world to like the average person. But it is extremely complex how it will be used um, in ways that we won't perceptively know that it's being used. And that's kind of where I, I went when you asked that question is that there will be models that talk to each other and they will make decisions and suggest results in ways that may or may not be good because we as biased humans actually built them, mm -hmm. right? So I think that's where kind of I started with the responsible AI. What, what can we do today to make sure that, that, that we protect ourselves against that? More importantly, we protect our children against that. So I feel like there is a question that I'm dying to ask, and it's like the question is sort of foundational for the whole panel. So I want to bring it back to that original question. Can machines be creative, Moro? Well, um, <coughs> it's a very hard uh, to answer because creativity changes from person to person. So if you compare a machine to a person that is not creative, so of course can, the task can look more easy to achieve. But if you want uh, a machine to be creative like Einstein, uh, well, we can be very lucky to have a machine like that because we can go to the direction of singularity. So um, yes or no, depend from the target. But um, I feel that, that there are some uh, structural problems in the way that we build uh, uh, technology based to neural net in particular today. They maybe uh, make it very hard uh, they, um, to achieve this goal to uh, be creative. But um, in terms of visual experience, uh, like what I said before by talking about one of my last experiments about sculpture with AI, uh, the system can generate trillion of sculpture. So, 
then of course so you can teach the system to classify in function to some aesthetic criteria. Maybe you can link this algorithm to social media to make floating this aesthetic criteria over the time. So there are many techniques that you can use to at, at least uh, deliver something that people feel is crazy beautiful and creative. But it's a function, in a sense, it's not really a real true creativity that comes from Picasso, Leonardo. It's a, a different thing, so it's a commercial creativity. It's a creativity that Coca-Cola can sell. Mm. You know? And uh, it's not bad, because it will improve the quality of our advertising, customized for a different target. But uh, the, the, final, uh, the final answer, is, I think, uh, is uh, we are working on that. Of course, uh, everybody will be very proud to have a machine that is super creative because we can advance our technology very quickly. But at the moment, uh, uh, the atmosphere is very pessimistic. So there is no really anybody that can say, uh, yeah, we're close to go there. So I think, um, unfortunately, it's not creative. Very unfortunately. Uh, can I jump in? Um, so here's a question for the audience. Can airplanes fly? Sure. Now here's another question. Can submarines swim? Right, so, so can machines be creative? It just m it the only substance to that question is what what you mean by creativity. The rest of the question is meaningless. It has nothing to do with, with machines. Um, there's like it's just a restating, the question that Alan Turing started with: Can machines think? So this is like whenever you read about Alan Turing's paper, it's like can machines think? That's what it's all about. And it's the first line of that book. If you turn to page like five of 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 it. He wrote that the question is too meaningless to deserve any attention. <laughs> and, and so that's page five or something like that. Thank you no for that. No one ever makes it that far. <laughs> Thank you for that because I wanted to say that uh, every time this question comes up, it deteriorates into either an argument about what consciousness is or an argument about what creativity is. And I feel like we can, so on the question of consciousness, I'm not qualified, I'm not a neuroscientist, and I'm not entirely convinced, convinced neuroscientists know what consciousness is. But in any case, I'm definitely not qualified to talk about it. So I just feel like that's not a question that I want to go into. Um, and on the question of what what is creativity, it's also, as you say, it's meaningless because if we disagree about the, you know, okay, so my definition of creativity maybe involves machines and yours doesn't, okay, then let's, let's differ opinions. But I, I think, the, the real crux of the question, the intention of the question is there is something really mesmerizing about the idea of a machine behaving autonomously. And in that autonomous action that it's performing, doing something, like generating something that didn't exist before, that's unlike anything else. That's mesmerizing. Like, let's talk about that. Right, um, and I, I like let's throw the other two questions out. But it is, I think, that's why we're here because we can't. We're, we're watching machines do stuff, and and that autonomous behavior, like uh, we don't have a language for it yet, for what it's doing, for why it's interesting, for uh, for why we can't look away. Well, I think, I think you're right. The question is, is it the machine that's doing it or is it the programmer of the machine that's doing it? Um, <coughs> excuse me. And, you know, uh, is there what, you know, and I, I think I, I agree with what Mauro was saying is it's, you know, we're only sort of scratching the surface of machine creativity. Um, you know, apparently it, it can, like, harmonize like Bach and uh, it, it can, you know, paint with, you know, brush strokes like, like some painter. And th those are things that I guess I, I would have considered creative and I, I certainly couldn't, couldn't do. Um, and the computer can do them, but it's, it, do it does them still kind of mechanically and with, it didn't invent a style, it just sort of lear learned a style. Right. Um, so I think, but you know, but 30 years ago we were, in those things, a computer couldn't do those things at all. So I think that we ha we've had made progress in the machine really sort of doing it and creating. And um, if you call it progress. <laughs> yeah. And you might be a Luddite. Um, but <laughs> uh, so the, and the question is, you know, how far does this go? And, and, where, and where does that take humanity? And, you know, is there a limit? Does it stop getting better and we'll never sort of have computers that sort of can really invent their own styles and not just sort of copy ours? 
actually. Or will uh, they? I don't know. Or will they get better and be better than anything that any human ever could have dreamed up or done? And That's right. I, yeah, I think basically she was saying it, it's about improving the ingenuity, right? Like, sure, okay, a machine can generate art, but it actually isn't a better thing. So, for example, we have this art generator. It generates these cool things. You can print them off, sell them on Shopify, right? It's really cool because it actually takes your, a picture of your face, maps it against the open data on the Met, and, like, creates a what looks like a Renaissance painting, but that looks like you. And people love it, and they buy it. But you know what they buy and pay more for and actually won't pay for anything they'll go to a museum to see? The human-generated art. Because one of the things we found is that people want to know the artist. They want to know their history. They want to know why they made that song, why they, right? Yeah, we'll, machines will create great art. That will happen. People will be like, oh my gosh, I can't believe a machine did that. That will happen. It may not happen in our lifetimes. Maybe you won't ever be able to cognitively grasp that it's better. And that's fine, but it's never going to solve our human need to actually know the story behind why that art was created. And this was where our Met uh, curators got to at the end of our hackathon. They were like, oh, it's cool that it can do that, but I can tell the story. And that ended up being the software we built, was software that allowed you to ask a ton of questions. As someone like my son who has Down syndrome, right, he could ask questions of art, and the art could answer back. And AI is the only way that that became possible. And that's, I, I would actually love to close our panel by asking, what, where do you see hope for artists with the technology that you've been exposed to so far? I spoke last, so. So, uh, I mean, I see hope all over the place. I, I'm uh, extremely hopeful. I just think, uh, so I'm actually gonna, <laughs> I, I'm mostly hopeful and then I've got some dark thoughts. Can't you just stay hopeful. <laughs> um, but my dark thoughts are around uh, the the fact that um, when film came along, people worried that it was going to be used for propaganda because it was and too exciting, and it was because it was too exciting and too novel and too visceral. And I have the same fears about these systems. They're too novel. People don't understand what they're looking at. The general population doesn't understand what they're seeing. And uh, and I think like the great way forward for democracy is to have a, a tech savvy. Uh, general population that is sort of amused by questions like, well, can machines be creative, right? Uh, like, I, I think that um, the great hope is that um, all of the worries we currently have about what, take, what AI uh, is doing or is or can become will seem quaint later because we will have already gotten past those questions. That's right. Anyone else? Let's, how about you, Jeff? Um, what, are you, what, what are your thoughts on this? My paintbrush of choice is in my hand. Hey. What makes me stand out as a photographer is that I know and have the skill to capture the most important thing. The thing that makes the work stand out is emotion. There is that Kodak moment, and I get it. And I see a lot of photographers' work. It's flat. It's lifeless. It's missing. For whatever reason, I have the gift. And in response to a comment that somebody made before that everybody copies, in my major bodies of work, they are not copied. They were not stimulated or started by anybody else's work. They came out of my head. If you can get the computer to make art with the motion, great. But right now, we're not there. I'm not saying we can't get there. And yes, I feel threatened by a lot of this. <laughs> and, I, and I don't like the path we're on necessarily. But you know, we could be said about a lot of things. Do, does anybody um, want to back up what Jeff is saying? Anybody agree, um, agree, disagree from our audience? Did it resonate with anyone? Well, it's funny because I was the one who said the copy thing, and I think that I want to defend what he said as well, which is that all artists, even the greatest artists, the roots of their work is in the people that came before them, but it's the way that they see slightly differently that makes them brilliant. And it's actually a lot our commonalities that make us human. And I think one of the things that I found myself thinking about as you were talking, like one of the best statements is like, yeah, can machines think? Like how ridiculous is that idea? Or can a machine be creative? When we really think about 
what has made Luddites Luddites for all of history. Um, you have these old movies like Weird Science mm -hmm. and then recently Her, which was really brilliantly done. Um, where I question when I think about human emotion and connection, neuroscience is something I'm super interested in. And it's been proven that like babies will die if they don't have connection and touch and stuff like this. So we are born needing to connect to other human beings, but we don't actually know how to. We are born needing to learn, and it comes from the outside in. You can't learn how to connect without other people. And so I often wonder if the obsession with can machines do these things that we can't do, does that come from our fear of doing the hard interpersonal work? Does that come from our inherent wanting to run away from uncomfortable conversations, wanting to avoid um, the discomfort that intimacy causes, which is actually the most important, greatest, and fundamentally rewarding work. And so I guess like I never want to see there not be a human behind that lens. I never want to see us forget that at the end of the day, um, the greatest things, the greatest pieces of work that we all get to experience are about usually the things that are the most uncomfortable or slightly not perfect and not just um, you know, a data set or numbers that are, are going to be aligned in some perfect way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think she That's wanted great. to jump in after that, by the way. Yeah. I'm fascinated by our um, obsession, though, and I don't know if it's a God complex, but like in, you know, the 1500s, early 1500s, Leonardo created an autonomous knight right and um, a few years ago they took his instructions and it worked you know and why are humans I mean the Pygmalion myth so this is something that runs throughout I mean fourth century CE a mathematician created um, a robot it was a, a bird anyone an owl I think or something right and so this has been an obsession that runs concurrent with you know humanism and our foregrounding ourselves on the planet over all other species and I, I'm just curious like why does that exist and and is this the culmination of thousands of years of you know kind of um, obsession with automata yes <laughs> And sort of my, my question is also actually right off of that. Um, and also my question prior was like in a positive light, like cool computers can talk to each other. Um, but to, to kind of dovetail off that question, um, the general population you spoke about, which is something that I'm very passionate about. And right now we live in a world where the general population is not educated on the things that we talk about in here. If you went you know, into Washington Square Park and try to tell yeah. people on the streets or have conversations with them. You're, every day, you know, these people are not understanding anything other than what the media is feeding them um, and what dystopian novels are telling them. And how can we counteract that and get the general population to see that hope and that beauty that we're talking about today? Art. Give it to artists. Give technology to artists. Tart artists are good at thinking critically about it and asking really hard questions and presenting those questions to the world. So like, don't let deep fakes just be in the hands of a few programmers who knows where. Like, Put them online, put that stuff online. Let artists do weird stuff with deep fake and let it go viral and let people figure out what deep fakes are from being exposed to them, right? So that like they they can't be harmful that way. I think make I more e movies like her and less like the Terminator. <laughs> yeah. I would even expand it to all creatives, right? We are in a space where art, yes but also those that are called to tell stories with their voice, stories with film, stories uh, on YouTube, stories on podcasts, right? These are all people that can add this narrative to educate the world. And yeah, I'm also very passionate about that and agree it's a necessity. Can I, well, there is an area of research that in, is very focused in the interpretability of neural net that is a base technology that we used to create all this art that we saw today. And uh, interpretability looks like far away from the world of art, uh, but in reality, more we know the way behavior, the neural net, uh, more we can introduce a dialogue between the artist and the neural net. At the moment, uh, is we start with a black box. In what way you can dialogue with a black box? No, you don't know in what way 
uh, um, compare your activity with the output that comes from the tool. But slowly, we introduce, we disentangle the neural net. Now we are able, and once one of the last paper uh, that come from my lab uh, together with some um, professor from MIT, is about uh, changing little part of the picture. So essentially, we want to introduce a real dialogue, not that the neural net produce output and you, sh you, sh you can just watch and say, oh, it's beautiful, it's, this inspired me so much. No, <laughs> you maybe ingest everything that you want, maybe very few pictures, we are moving to generate a uh, training network, very small amount of picture that really represent yourself. And then the, the system will understand your style and propose picture. But the nice part, until you just uh, see and maybe ask uh, redo, no, rebuild, and you see another picture, is not real dialogue. But now, by research into interpretability, you can modify a little part of the draw. And say, look, I don't know what color to put there. Can you give me a suggestion? It just work with you. So you make a draw together to the eye. You start to create a dialogue. So more we know what's going on in the neural net, more we know in what way to create a dialogue between you and the neural net. And this means in the very coming future, probably one year or a little bit more, you, you will be able to draw, and the system can draw together with you, suggest other things. And maybe you can ask, look, I lock my draw, but I don't like this part. Can you help me? And the help comes from yourself, because you, you train in the system with your style. So in some way, it's a way to dialogue with yourself. And this can be a very magic interaction. In some way, an interaction that we, we never experiment before, because artists frequently they are alone, and sometimes they are with critic, you not know, they talk about his work and then, but now we can talk with something that is no human. It's made by human, it's no human, and just dialogue in a way that you're training. So it can be completely a new different type of dialogue that this would be really a revolution in art. Not because art become a field of AI, I don't believe at all, but because of AI start to create a dialogue with artists. So I really believe, I work with data from financial, from any type of uh, uh, industry, that AI is made for artists. There's no one best target in the world, the artist. It would be the best things that would come to art, uh, create this new conversation with uh, something that is with no friend, with no woman. It's something different. It's a no human dialogue. And uh, I can't wait to see the result. One of the tricks at art school was uh, if you're feeling stuck, you know, don't just keep looking at the blank piece of paper, like throw some crap on it and then then start working, right? Because you're responding to something. And I think what you're describing is pretty much similar. I want to uh, bring this conversation back, if uh, I can, um, to the issue of bias. I am an academic and a creative practitioner. And uh, going back to this fear of um, pr uh, you know, bias programming, which is passed on from one generation to another, which informs the entire knowledge system, why are we suddenly scared about this in the context of creativity when we are not really that threatened by it in the context of academia? Because academics also have, a, you know, there is gatekeeping within academia. Certain systems of knowledge are allowed to pass on and certain things are held back and we, are, we have informed entire generation after generation in that way and conditioned them to think. So I just would like, because there are academics um, who are also practitioners here who, uh, you know, have seen both sides of the world. So if, yeah. From a purely technical perspective, software can be extremely pervasive, especially when it is being surfaced by large organizations like IBM, Microsoft, Amazon, where it can literally show up in billions of devices and homes, where academia is a little bit more siloed, right? Like a instructor or a teacher or a methodology, right? It, ten it can't be in every single laptop overnight. Um, so, so I think probably the burden that we have seen, at least at Microsoft, that we are now called to respond to is less about fear and more about acknowledgement that we're building something important and that it can be extremely, uh, it'll show up in, way, in, a, in a massive way. So we want to be responsible about how we build it. I don't think we're coming to it out of fear more than out of, I'd rather be the one that thought about it first rather than had to fix it 
later, and that would be way harder to do. So that's just from, again, like a Microsoft's uh, reasoning behind going into it from our side, but I don't know why in academia, if maybe someone, I didn't do that part. Yeah, I know, I think um, it's maybe it's just better late than never. I mean, uh, bias has been a problem forever, and um, it's great that biased models and biased AIs are getting attention. I'm, I'm glad people are uh, worried about it, but yeah, it's it's a it's an it's a timeless problem, um, and I guess maybe part of why it's coming up is uh, it's easier to sort of blame somebody else if you know it's harder to s admit that you or your organization is a sort of biased participant, and when it's an AI doing it, you can sort of blame that and you can blame the programmer. So we've got just one more. This this is quite far afield from. Uh, that Maro, I, I, it looked like you were visualizing uh, the shape of the of your neural networks. Uh, are are those representing the the neural network itself? It's like looking at a brain and saying, "Is that what's the shape of this brain? How does it work?" And if you if you have been visualizing the shape of these these huge matrices or whatever the tensors, are are some of them be more beautiful than others? Is it possible to paint onto the neural network? It's neural paths and, and get something interesting from it? Uh, very good question. Um, well, uh, um, probably yes. I, it's something that um, I need to try to, um, there are many group that visualize the activity of a, of a neural net that you're training, training with picture, especially. No, so it's more easy to understand what's going on inside, the reason why some pattern is, is emerge in some layer of the neural net. Uh, and uh, some of the picture that was in my slide in some way represented this output from a neural, from one uh, convolutional neural net in that case. Um, so you can highlight some specific layer, you can uh, uh, bombing with some uh, flow of information to create some output. The combination are really infinite, and I think we explore very well the aesthetic of neural net in terms of just visualizing neural net uh, five, six years ago. Now it's almost, I can, so the, the visualization that especially come from you, I, because I follow you in Twitter, I really go in this direction. So explore the aesthetic when you essentially, um, you're interested in to understand uh, uh, what is uh, the more active uh, neuron and what is fire more in what layer. And you try to uh, plot all this information by using some little trick to no, to clean some noise. And it's not really my work. I never did it. I, I'm, I'm focusing on other things. But uh, the aesthetic of a neural network itself, uh, let me know if I'm right, I think uh, we explored very well like three, four years ago, no? I don't know if there's something more to say about the aesthetic of just the neural net. Uh, oh, I don't, well, uh, you have different neural networks trained on different data sets so that you can always like use similar techniques to to kind of try to you know like characterize each of them but uh, aesthetic more or less is you know no not, not necessarily if you look at only like what google puts on their blog post then you know they have an aesthetic but but there's there's actually a lot of re the research goes back like even farther maybe 10 years ago i agree, agree. um there's there's people taking in different directions i'd say and yeah, it always it'll change completely if you if you train it on a different set of images or sounds or um, yeah. But mm, in terms in of the style, lo low know. low layers of the network, not to get too technical, like the, then they tend to be very similar. But um, but that's because like there's like there's there's actually very few ways of seeing in the, in the in sense like the way like once you get to just you know pattern recognition like basic stuff it's like the same patterns kind of kind of kind of work there's very few ways of characterizing simple patterns it's really fun i think we i love that we ended the day like talking to each other like we're just hanging out at the coffee shop. I think it's fantastic. I hope that we will dis continue these discussions. I think we're all probably on a social media network or so, uh, LinkedIn or Twitter. It's a great opportunity really just to stay connected and keep these conversations going. So I want to thank our panel and really more importantly, thank you all for staying. Um, and uh, I just really appreciate it. So thank you guys.